We enter the crisp, nutrient-full waters of Port Gore in search of the Russian passenger liner, Mikhail Lermontov. The Mikhail Lermontov has been here since February the 16th, 1986, after she struck one of the reefs between Cape Jackson and the Jackson Head Beacon under mysterious circumstances. The mooring line itself shows how much plankton must pass through this area. There's a lot of growth on the line and the spotties devotedly watch over it and keep it groomed as it is their territory. The Lermontov lies on its side and has been here long enough to have developed into a reef 176 meters long and about 24 meters high. The line break that once held the Mikhail Lermontov securely to wharves around the world is now encrusted with growth as it stares down the abyss of the foredeck. The anchor chain is still here and is now redundant as far as holding this ship in position, but the very large links have found a new life providing grazing for the leather jackets and a place where the sea cucumbers sift through the sand particles carried here by the current. As the foredeck is on such an extreme angle, sometimes it's like a cliff face. All of the machinery still remains in place but is covered with thick marine growth. As we swim towards the bow, we see many different species going about their daily routines. There are terakee, blue cod, sea perch, spotties, kohiru, leather jacket and sea cucumber. A very normal reef system. The sea cucumbers along the companionway are busy keeping the place tidy by sorting through the sand. Their numbers reflect the well-being of this artificial reef. There are many stairs joining the companionways on the foredeck. Many of the guests would have wandered through here on their way to the bars, the shops, the cinema, the sunbathing areas or even the swimming pool. These days the stairs host mussels, the common and jeweled anemone and the sea squirts. The skewed wreckage can sometimes mesmerize the unsuspecting diver. As we move along admiring the scenery, we must be fully aware of the ropes, beams and sharp corners that will cut or trap us. This amazing place is one you want to visit and be able to leave. As the scarlet wrasse looks in on us, we find a tube worm growing out of the debris. The tube worm is unusually slow in retreating, which gives us the opportunity to see it in detail. The handrails slowly become a part of the background as sea life expands, thus reducing light penetration in the space between the struts and balustrades. Light of the torch reveals the true colours of the surroundings, which are normally locked in deep darkness. Objects and specific parts of the ship, which are used by divers as orientation points, are swallowed by the relentless spread of the underwater habitat, making this journey an increasingly hazardous one. Hanging ropes, cables and sharp objects are slowly getting lost on this vast living shell.
We explore the superstructure along the top of the wreck, where we are hailed by what appear to be two giant cake mixers. They are in fact the radio signal receivers and the radar dome. Cables and lines that hold these structures in place constantly threaten to entangle divers and trap them here forever. When the Mikhail Lermontov was in port, these same cables and lines would have carried a myriad of different coloured lights that would have lit up the ship like a Christmas tree. Now these lines play host to many different filter feeders that are in turn food for other residents of the wreck. We invite ourselves into one of the ship's cabins. The drapes, the hand basin, the toilet and even the air conditioning unit on the wall still remain covered by sea dust. From our cabin we make our way to the bridge. It was from here that the whole ship was controlled. One of the instrument panels stands still and empty of its machinery. Considering that this point used to offer the best view, the bridge now feels almost claustrophobic. An anemone completely encrusts an edge of a doorway that we pass through. They grab food particles that stream by with their sticky tentacles and are flourishing here.
In one of the enclosed walkways high on the ship, we find a school of small kohiru and a single curious taraki taking shelter here. When entering any wreck, the diver must be completely aware of the many apparent and hidden dangers. We enter the Nevsky bar through one of the windows. The water is much colder in here. Tables protrude out of the floor at a steep angle, and the whole room appears slanted and mystifying. Inside the Lermontov, visibility diminishes rapidly. Without direct access to the surface, a small lapse in concentration can mean a quick and lonely death as you panic and become disoriented. Even with lengthy training and experience, the diver should approach this wreck with extreme caution and respect. Lives have already been lost in this metal labyrinth. We descend the stairs to the enclosed pathway below, where a light passing through one of the broken windows calls to us. This is the video arcade, and it has seen far better days. Although it's brighter here than in the Nevsky bar, we must remind ourselves that we are still in an overhead environment and that our route to the surface is blocked. Along from the video arcade, we find another watering hole, the Festival Lounge. These booths have heard countless stories in their time, but now all is silent.
can of Turkish beer reminds us of the international atmosphere that once lined the walls of this Russian liner as it cruised through New Zealand waters. Towards the stern from the video arcade is one of the main entrances to the ship, and nearby is also the way to the cinema. Many of the Mikhail Lermontov's passengers would first arrive through here when looking to get settled in for their holiday on board. As with all the other areas inside this wreck, it is now very murky, dark and cold in here. As the walls and part of the ceiling have collapsed, the cinema itself is now closed forever. There's no movie playing today, only a few empty seats awaiting the queuing patrons. Up ahead is one of the ship's main stairways. The black glass panels have growth on them forming unusual patterns. Looking up the stairway, we see many wires hanging down, protecting the stairs. The anemones have made their home here, as it is a prime feeding position. From the entrance, we make our way to one of the larger bars of the ship called the Bolshoi Lounge. Chairs have piled up here after the ship turned on her side. The chandelier that sparkled as the passengers danced their cares away now points across this deep canyon, gathering filter feeders and dust. Not far along the ceiling is the edge of the mezzanine floor. It is surrounded with black glass panels like the ones we found in the entranceway.
We are now behind the funnel and are entering the engine room. Inside the skylight, we find that the vent area is about six meters square and has pipes and stairways attached to all the walls of the vent. Looking from the inside of the vent to the skylights and ladders, we can see a lot of marine growth. Even some of the fish visit here. Inside, just behind the skylights, are sea perch, teraki, and spotties. The safety diver brings with him a penetration reel that he will use to help us find our way out of here. What we're about to witness has only been seen firsthand by a handful of professional divers. We are descending into the sinister darkness of the engine room, deep in the bowels of the wreck. As we head for the launching area for our descent to the engines, we are greeted by a few southern bastard cod. These fish seem to be waiting here as a last warning to the gambling diver. vent walls eventually disappear and all that is left is darkness. We must cross this black canyon before we find the highest catwalks and ladders in the engine room. Now there is no visual reference for us to find our way to the skylights. We are between the 10,500 horsepower Sulzer diesel engines with the port engine above us due to the way the wreck is lying. Each engine stands at about the same height as a three-story building and is woven through with valves and pipes. As we move back up the engine, we find a fluorescent light that is of no help to us now, but would have been vital in its day. Mm. 
many of the pipes were insulated to lessen the noise and prevent the crew from being burned as they strolled down these silent catwalks. Coming out of the engine room, alive and well, leaves the diver with an undeniably unique feeling that is not to be forgotten, and an understanding that only a few others in the world share the experience of such an ominous, yet exciting place. There are still a few parts of the ship left for us to look at, such as the depth markers, just in and above the port propeller. hosts a sea perch sitting on the foredeck machinery. another tube worm before it draws from sight. The diver's hand gives us an idea of the size of the links in the anchor chain as he examines them. On the way up to the funnel, we are closely watched by the many resident sea perch. The Mikhail Lomontov is an amazing shipwreck, and more than that, a complex reef system. It holds many more surprises that need to be seen firsthand to be believed. For only when you are in her presence will you truly have a story to tell. The 
the SS Wairarapa was sailing at her maximum speed of almost 14 knots when she crashed ashore, blinded by a mantle of thick fog. Her final voyage from Sydney to Auckland in 1894 was to become one of New Zealand's worst maritime tragedies, with 125 of her crew and passengers perishing in the darkness of the sea. The bottom of the bay that now holds her remains is made up of coarse sand and pebbles that have formed into corrugations due to the wave action in the bay. We find an eagle ray who seems to be guarding the remains of a fishtail in one of the troughs of the corrugated bottom. As it becomes more aware of our presence, it attempts to hide the fishtail from us, hoping we will leave it in peace. Eventually, its instincts tell it that the tail is not worth the risk and it hastily glides away. As we move closer to Great Barrier Island and the wreck site, we experience the surge that has helped to form the bottom. The first part of the wider upper wreckage we find is a section of the hull that still has three portholes in it. They are all embedded just above the sand and the small pebbles. All it would take is an abrupt storm to cover it up. Most divers examine portholes very closely since they aren't present on many shipwrecks anymore. This piece of the hull has been bent into a V-shape and clearly displays the power of the ocean. Some of the locals hang around keeping an eye on us. fish in the hull, the two-spot demoiselle and a juvenile goatfish, both of whom would live on or around this shipwreck. The abundant kelp has made itself at home by attaching to the outside of the hull along with other marine growth. All around the wreck there are traces of ribs and openings where once stood portholes but now are merely hollow eyes gazing at the void. In some places, the steel hull has fallen into the surrounding rocks and now forms a very scenic swim through and overhang, which is highlighted by startling marine organisms. Schools of kohiru and yellowtail are an integral part of the food chain on this wreck. Embedded in the growth covering the hull itself, a couple of hydroid trees, better known as fans, have made their home here. In this area, an indicator of the good health of this artificial reef are the sweep and red moki. Red moki are always the first to vanish if things aren't right with the reef. The 
food chain here is identical to other reef systems found in this region, and the importance of the wreck as a natural habitat can't be overstated. As we swim over the wreckage, we notice numerous round boulders scattered throughout the hull. The thickness of growth covering them indicates how long they've been here. They too have a big part to play in the destruction of the remains of the Wairarapa. The boulders would certainly crush everything in their path as they fell from the surrounding cliffs. These natural causes, in combination with the explosives used by treasure hunters, have scattered the wreck over quite a wide area. The ribs and beams of the wreck form countless cave-like areas that provide for the fish such as the red moki, a place to live and protection from predators. Because of the rapid water movement through this area, numerous filter feeders such as the extravagantly named Dead Man's Finger Sponge also reside here. Most of the time, the wreckage looks exactly the same as the rocks next to it, with the sponge growth and kelp covering everything. The lower part of this ship contains great swimming tunnels for a diver of the right size. The green algae on the steel beams and surrounding rocks are another indicator of the good health of the area. The anchor chain is piled high and the links are very large. Even after more than a hundred years of being here, it still looks very heavy. It reminds us of how big the White Arapa must have been in its day.
Along the side of the anchor chain is an area that has a lot of wire and sharp pieces of steel in it, requiring the diver to take extra special care. As we swim around the SS Wairarapa, a very famous and absorbing shipwreck, her silence speaks volumes of the horrors she has known, as the sea continues to tear her apart. A ship 160 meters long, Slamming into a reef on a stormy night would be a sight not easily forgotten. Off the bow, jagged rocks looming up on all sides and the air filled with the raging surf tearing at the cliff face. The waves smashed relentlessly onto the stricken ship and eventually broke her in two. From the bridge to the stern, broke away to stand on end and slowly slip beneath the surface. In 30 meters of water, we head in towards Great Barrier Island, looking for the wreck of the TSS Wiltshire, which went to the bottom in 1922. We find a rib section that has become a reef itself. The ribs have been completely covered in sponges anemones and kelp. Snapper, Sweep and Two Spot Demoiselles have also made this place home and are all part of the reef system that has developed here over the years. The wreckage is very scattered, partly from the strong currents in this very exposed part of the coast but also as a result of treasure hunters using extreme methods to free the booty she went down with. We swim towards the coast, dodging steel girders and beams in our way, and skirting by other fish in the food chain, Maddo and Red Moki. As we look around at the pieces of wreckage resting silently, we can only imagine the roaring that split the air as the Wiltshire severed in two. Some parts of debris are so covered in kelp and sponges, they could easily be mistaken for rock. Only when we look closely do shapes stand out as being made by the human hand. The huge pieces of the hull, with countless rows of rivets joining everything together, remind us more of the wings of an old plane rather than a ship. Looking around where there are layers of steel sheets, there is not one millimetre of free real estate available for the newcomers. Every piece of encrusting sponge, anemone and kelp has floated here on the current and found an empty spot to stick to, whether a rock or a steel beam or girder. The big beams and posts that stand up like monuments are even better places for marine life to grow. Golf ball sponges, sea squirts and kelp flourish, neatly trimmed by the local red moki and leather jacket. A 
a red pigfish tries to distract us from our adventure. As the divers go by, the plankton is highlighted. See how abundant the food is here. No wonder the filter feeders thrive. As we approach the front of the wheelchair, more of her cargo can be seen. Also, with more light penetrating the depths here, marine life is abundant. As we move up the piles of pipes, tubes and beams, we see how the encrusting sponges have really made themselves at home here and give everything a colourful, textured appearance. The scarlet rus swims around the large stack of pipes almost like it's on a tour of the estate, making sure everything is in order. Along from the pipes are some very large wheels and machinery that now lie still, providing a sheltered habitat for marine life. As we move around this ship, it is hard to picture where some of these pieces went, what they were used for, and by whom. One thing is easy to see. The Wiltshire has become more of a reef now than a wreck. There are areas where the sheets of steel are laid down and form shelves that the fish use for their normal existence. Even the small spaces between the lower beams and the rocks are used as caves by the red moki and big eye. The cock, seen here, is at least two metres in diameter and alludes to the original size of the engine itself. The kelp has almost taken over this area of the ship. A diver appears again, giving a better perspective in establishing the size of the wrecked parts and also the amount of kelp present due to sunlight penetration.
Some of the machinery here is colossal and makes the divers appear quite insignificant. For shipwreck enthusiasts, this is one of the great locations in New Zealand and offers so much to the diver. This site boasts every marine animal you may ever wish to see and they're always keen to pose for the camera. But best of all is the fact that the Wiltshire is soaked in history. The more adventurous try and squeeze into the small spaces below the deck, but they must be careful. The Wiltshire can lure and trap the unwary diver. This wreck site is akin to a giant jigsaw puzzle without the picture to help us put it together. Many different types of fish live here, from two-spot demoiselles to silver drummer and kingfish. But also, there are twice as many marine animals that aren't so obvious to the eye, like encrusting sponges and jewel anemones. They all play a vital part in the ecosystem formed around what was the TSS Wiltshire. That stormy night on May 31st, 1922, was the end of a beautiful ship, but the start of an even more beautiful reef. The soaring cliffs of West Island would have been certainly a chilling sight for the crew and passengers aboard the SS Ilingamite. The rock face, which emerged out of the haze on the morning of November 9, 1902, 
foreshadowed that there was nothing Captain Ernest Atwood could do to prevent the events that followed. Before long, the Alingamite was on her way to the bottom. Down we go, following the wall that she struck, looking for what remains. The terrain is very steep, almost vertical for the first 15 meters or so. Below this, the reef, as sheer as the cliffs above, just drops into the blue waters. The strong currents that flow through here have carved out formations on the bottom. In the midst of the kelp, we find a camouflaged octopus. This is not a usual place for an octopus to be, but then again, there's nothing usual about this place. Above us circle dense schools of plankton-eating fish, including pink maumau, two-spot demoiselles, and butterfly perch. They make this enchanting picture complete. Along the bottom of the steep reef are boulders covered in anemones and soft corals, adding their amazing colours. The clouds of fish move just enough for us to pass by, and a part of the wreckage reveals itself. It has also become part of the colourful reef and could so easily go unnoticed. Along the base of the steep reef are many large boulders that were probably part of the island in days gone by. Beyond the large boulders, the terrain disappears into blue valleys of low-lying rocks and kelp. As we swim along the base of this site, in amongst the boulders and kelp, we see the man-made shapes of the wreckage. Sponges, anemones and fans give schooling for shelter from the ever-present currents. As the boulders have come rolling down from above, they have formed great swim-throughs and canyons that are fascinating to explore. Exploring these boulders around the base of the reef, we see the growth that covers them also covers the wreckage that is scattered around. Only the uniformity of their shape identifies them as being man-made. On the seaward side of one boulder is a beautifully growing tube sponge. By looking closely at it, we can see the individual chambers where water is filtered through. Down from this boulder, there's a gully that descends into the valley below. Each side of the gully has been lined with delicate soft corals and fans. 
all of this proof that there is plenty of plankton swimming past here. Looking in, around and under these great boulders, wooden beams, girders, and even a couple of different sized pipes appear, all completely covered with marine growth. Fans are a good indicator of the direction and amount of plankton-filled current that passes here. They are always on a 90 degree angle to the current to get as much water over the fan as possible. This area is also rich with crayfish, tube sponges, and a juvenile grey moray eel. Notice the ceramic tile to the right of this particular moray eel. Heading up towards the main part of the wreckage, in amongst the large boulders, a porcupine fish tries to sneak past us. Its little fins seem to work overtime to propel this fish through the water. Even so, these fish can easily outpace a diver trying to take a photo. There is wreckage spread from depths of 45 to 50 meters, up to 10 meters, with most of it being at around 20 to 35 meters. In the main area of wreckage, it's almost as if someone has poured concrete over everything as a safeguard. In fact, it's the marine growth that is protecting the treasures of this ship. A hollow in the sea floor reveals broken pieces of plate and ceramic tiles. This coin is an example of the cargo that included 6,000 gold sovereigns and approximately 14,000 pound in silver coin. Many of these are still scattered in the layers of silt as the wreck is disturbed by both environmental conditions and treasure hunters. As the Alingamite slipped below the surface, she took her treasure down with her, and the plunder has been locked into the wreckage by marine growth ever since. She also took 45 souls with her that day, and a couple of divers since.
this is a very rough and weather-beaten part of the world. If you decide to try your luck in search of gold, make sure your skills and experience are equal to the task.